real estate is a lifelong pursuit and that pursuit changes and scales over time. If 2020 taught us anything, it's that anything can happen and we don't have control over it. And we basically are like a ship on this ocean. Somebody else is out there like pumping the waves. Yes. Here's the thing I learned. Your opinion does not entitle you to influence, okay? It, it does not entitle you to influence. You have to go and create wealth and money. Right, but that doesn't happen if you don't A, do the deals and not be a douche canoe. <laughs> <laughs> Douche canoe. <laughs> here's another question for you. All right, I've, guys, we've got Henry Washington in the, in the studio today, sitting here chatting it up. I've got a handful of questions we're going to go through today, so you'll see multiple videos po uh, popping up over the next several weeks. First question, okay, non-market specific. Yep. What is your end goal, right? So like a high performer, mm -hmm. high performer, we always want to look at each other and go, okay, well, I, want to, I want to take game from you. I want to take notes down. What, yep. what do you think like is your, I'm, tr I'm, I'm riding off in the sunset. Yeah. What, what does that business look like? Is yeah. it somebody comes in and takes everything over, your business continues to make money, but you're involved 10 hours a week? Mm -hmm. Is it you sell everything and you go, I'm all cash, I'm going to become a lender now? W what do you think is like, Henry Washington's I'm trailing off into the sunset, mm -hmm. I'm done type of moment. Yeah, man. You know, I, you know, I, I hear this question sometimes and I feel like I'm supposed to have this super sexy answer. I don't think there uh, is one. And I, and I don't. I love this business so much. I love that I get to leave things better than I found them. Mm. I get to leave physical assets better than I found them by improving them. I get to leave relationships better than I found them. I get to leave sellers better than I found them, right? I'm, uh, it's such a- Contractors too. Con absolutely, right? Contractors, you make their life easier if you can give them steady work. Right? I did I did the equation. So I used to be a contractor for a long time, for 10 years, and I did the equation of how many people make money off a wholesale transaction to an end buyer, yeah. and it's 51 people. 51 people make money when a wholesaler assigns a deal to a fix and flipper, fix and flipper fixes and flips the property, sells it to an end buyer. Yep. There's home warranty companies, notaries, agents, contractors, carpet guy, tile guy, yep. con concrete guy, electrician, plumber, all these people, their helpers, etc. Then you've got the appraisers, you've got the agents on, on mm -hmm. this side, the title and escrow company. I mean, it's 51 people get paid on one deal. Every deal is like its own little economy, man. It's it is nuts. crazy. Yeah. So it when is. you say that you leave the, the world be a better place, you tr genuinely, genuinely. Are like very literal. Very, very literal. And I love everything about it. So I, I always tell people, I'm going to keep my own property until God or my wife tells me not to. Mm. So uh, there's that. But there's some strat some strategery, if you will, within that. And so for me, like there's a, there's a part of like, you have to learn and then you execute, right? And then you grow and scale. And then at some point you've got to protect, right? Mm -hmm. So for me now, we're working on that protection set. And so there's a couple ways to think about that. Obviously there's entities and tax strategies, but that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. So the, I want to be recession proof mm -hmm. in the majority of my portfolio. And so that means at the right time, do I look at my total portfolio and see how much of it do I need to sell to pay off the majority of it, right? Because mm. I can go get more deals, Pace, right? If I sell 20 to pay off 30, right? And then you I got just go get more free and clear. I can right. go get more, but I've always got those free and clear assets, generational wealth. Like that's what that is at that point because it's recession proof. It's an interesting way to look at it. I really like that. Especially when you're first getting in, you're just like, I want to get more deals. I want to get more deals. But at some point you do have to get into protection mode. Yeah. Right. Because you're like, I spent all these years, sometimes three or four years just to gain any right. sort of momentum. Right. You finally get momentum. By the way, people out there that think that you should be like scaled, done, retired within a year of being in real estate. <laughs> real estate is a lifelong pursuit and that pursuit changes and scales over time. So yep. I like that you, you learn, you scale and then you protect. Yep. So your thought is, well, I could sell 20 of those. And the person down here that's just starting out, this is what you're saying, yeah. is saying, what are you doing selling 20 of your assets? Did right. you work so hard to go get right. those? And you're like, no, 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 That's the goal. The right. goal is to sell 20, get the cash, pay off the other 30, right? Right. right. I can go get more deals. Right. I will be, I, I've proven that that works. I know I can go get more deals. And so now it's like, you know, you know, investors, old investors always tell you never sell anything. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't believe that that's 
realistic always. And if I can get recession proof sooner, right? Because if 2020 taught us anything, it's that anything can happen and we don't have control over it. And so who's to say some other pandemic or war starts and it affects real estate on some scale and I lose all my stuff, man. Like, I just want to protect it. I think that's a really great point because you look at this political environment and I feel like a pawn in everybody right. else's game. Right. Guys, you want to make actual real change, go make way more money because we're, <laughs> right. we make good, we make really good money, but we, yeah. we change zero in the, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And we basically are like a ship on this ocean. Yeah. Somebody else is out there like pumping the waves. Yeah. And so you don't know what could happen, right? I remember when um, COVID hit March 15th, mm-hmm. Jamil and I were flying back from Chicago and um, we land Trump then comes on national emergency. I look at the Chicago airport the day after we left it, and it was ghost town, bro. It, no, it was the opposite. It was yeah. everybody was trying, like, oh it, yeah, it was they shut down flights. It yeah. was this whole thing, and I'm like, what world are we living in right now? I go into my acquisition department, and I'm like, everything's gonna be okay. Every <laughs> everything's gonna be okay. And I, t- I call my partner Cody, and I go, e- everything's not gonna be okay. <laughs> We, you know, and I, you know, because you got to wear that face as a business owner. So I, I want to second what you said is that the, anything can happen. And so when you're going through and you go, you go, look, man, I acquired all these properties. I need to put myself in a situation that when these people are playing political games, they're not playing games with me. Right. And they're not playing games with my two kids. Right. Right. You, you have two girls, two girls. I got two girls as well. So in that grand scheme of things, you want to, what I'm hearing is you want to continue to scale your real estate business because this isn't really work for you. Right. This is fun. Absolutely. You get to hang out with cool people. Absolutely. You get to collab with like friends of yours. Everybody's on the same wavelength. Yeah. You get to have a lot of fun, like building a legacy, especially in your local smaller town. Pace gets to buy me caviar. I, yeah, we did buy, Jamil actually paid for that. Jamil did pay for the caviar. Uh, guys, go DM Jamil on Instagram and say, buy me $350 caviar. <laughs> Jamil literally bought $350 caviar last night for dinner. Um, never had anything like that before. And then the very next morning, I had a breakfast burrito from like a Hispanic little <laughs> taco shop. <laughs> so uh, guess what? The burrito was better, to be honest. It's, it's four bucks. Right. Okay, so um, now you've got two daughters, yeah. right? And they're y- relatively young. So do you see a point where you'll try and nuance them into your business at some point? Or do you yeah. are you hands off on that? I mean, uh, I'm the guy who tries to bring all my friends into real estate, mm-hmm. like kicking and screaming if I have to. Like at some point, they'll wake up and realize, oh, I should have been doing this. Right? right. And so absolutely, I want my kids to be involved in it. Now, if they're if they just don't want to be, I'm not going to force it on them, but it's going to, it's, it's already a part of their lives. It's already a part of who they are because it's so much a part of who I am. Right. Like I I was telling you the other day when we drive by a house and it's like, and she sees there's people working on it. My four-year-old, she'll say, dad, they're not going, they're not getting that house done fast enough. (laughs) And that must be how she sees. (laughs) I talk to my contractor. So that's that's what she says. Every time she sees somebody working on a house, they need to get that done faster. They need to do more bamming. So, more bamming, more bamming, right? More bamming. So it's already a part of who they are. Um, do I want them to be invested in real estate? Of course, I want them to be able to to use it as a tool to build wealth. But more importantly, I just want to teach them financial education because I mean they're they're smart, special kids, and they're going to be able to generate income however they see fit. I just want them to know how to how to do right by it and understand that. They're, they just need to be good stewards of it. Yeah, I think, you know, looking at the trajectory, right? You're, how old are you? 41. Okay, so you're, we're relatively the same age. I'm turning 40 in like a couple months. Yeah. So you've got two daughters, you're 41. You've got, you know, another 40 years mm-hmm. um, where you're going to work your, your butt off, right? I'm mm-hmm. probably going to die of a heart attack at 97 because <laughs> I'm going to just continue to work. Yeah. Your daughters are not going to be the people that have to go figure out how to find deals. Right. Right there. Here, here's my take on this, and it, this is what I'm listening and, and dissecting, is that your job is to go as far down the path as you possibly can, so that the problems of today are problems that your daughters never have to live through, so that your daughter, daughters can solve new problems. One hundred percent. I don't want them to live through it. I want them to be able to figure out how to fix them. Right. And so that's the thing is, I see a lot of people like, no, I'm going to let my kids kind of figure it out. It's like, dude, you went through and you solved all these problems. And we know all this is is a, a, an evolution of bigger right. and bigger and bigger problems. That's right. So the more money you make, 
you got more tax burden, yeah. you got more this, you got more management, you need to hire people to take care of things. Before we started this um, YouTube video, you're sitting there going, um, yeah, call this other person. Right, <laughs> yes. Which yes. means you've built a team. Right. So you don't want your daughters to start brand new in real estate. You want them to take over the momentum that you've already built right. so that they can go solve real big issues. And and I imagine that your daughters, being your, the daughter of you, have an intelligence, a, a, an ability to go into their local market and actually change politics. Absolutely. Based on the fact that your guys' legacy and your family has built up enough wealth that you, they truly can be not right. only a good steward of the business, but of their local geography. Have the influence, right? Have the influence. Yep, absolutely. Just your opinion. Guys, here's the thing I learned. Your opinion does not entitle you to influence, <laughs> okay? It, it does not entitle you to influence. You have to go and create wealth and money. The only thing that gets attention is wealth, mo momentum, and money. You've got, to, you've got to create dollars or eyeballs. Dollars or eyeballs. That is 100% correct. And so if you don't have anything right? And you don't have the ability to hire people and affect change and have a team and all that kind of stuff. Having assets like that, mm -hmm. right? Single family homes, real estate, whatever, allows you to hire people. That's right. And build a team. Uh, absolutely. And it allows you to, it, and it, people don't think about the, the good name that you create, mm -hmm. but because you're right, you're, you're influencing and impacting all of these people's money, right? None of them 51 people eat unless you do that deal. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you not only provide them multiple situations where they get to eat, where they get to grow their business and you are, as you're transacting, you're also being a good steward of the, of the relationship that you have with that person. Like people talk, right? People talk. And when somebody says, Hey, have you heard about this pace guy? He owns a bunch of houses out here. That's one thing to say, but somebody says, have you heard about this pace guy? He owns a bunch of houses out here and he's just, he's an amazing person. You should, you're talking with the mayor next week. You should see what pace says about affordable housing, right? But that doesn't happen if you don't a do the deals and not be a douche canoe. <laughs> <laughs> douche canoe. Okay. So when you're, when you're brand new, right? And I, what we'll do in the next video, guys, you'll see another video is We'll go through Henry's um, origin story, right? He's a superhero to a lot of people, including me, including somebody at dinner last night. Like people are recognizing <laughs> you. You're not even in Arkansas. And people are recognizing yeah. you at like very fancy dinners, yeah. right? So um, we'll go through your origin story. But when you're very brand new, mm -hmm. there's always a number that you say to yourself, like once I hit this number... <laughs> And I think this evolves definitely mm -hmm. over time. Absolutely. As you hit that number, you're like, wait, what was what was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought that was a lot of money. Yeah. Was do you remember the first time you thought to yourself, I'm gonna get into real estate? If I can hit this number, yeah. that's my freedom number. Oh, yeah. Five yeah. grand a month, ten grand a month. Yeah. What is it? No, we were looking to make um I wanted to make I wanted to do two transactions and make five thousand from each transaction per month was my original goal. So ten grand a month. Okay, so Love that. Yeah. Now you've got a goal of ten thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Do you think that other people getting into business should have the same type of goal, or do you believe in the adage of like, think bigger, dream bigger, blah 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 blah? Or do you think mm -hmm. it serves you to go look? I'm going to take something bite sized down, something mm -hmm. digestible, and jump on that, accomplish it, let my brain and my mindset evolve to the next goal. Yeah, I'm more on the latter. Right. So what, what I want people to think about is if you try to set a goal now mm -hmm. based on what you currently know about investing in real estate, you're going to shoot too small because mm -hmm. you don't know. You don't have proof of concept yet. You don't know what you can actually do. When I before I did my first deal pace, I, I wrote down our we, I still have the book. We wrote our goals down in. I found this little book in an airport in, in Key West and it was and it had like pigs with wings on it and said when pigs fly. And that's like my goal book. Wow. Right. And so uh, we put that we wanted to buy one house a year for the next five years as our original goals before I ever did a deal. And then after I bought my very first house, I leveraged essentially monopoly money for the debt to pay for the down payment. I bought the house and it started paying me 90 days before I bought that house. I had a panic attack because I didn't know how I was going to be able to make enough money to give my wife the life she deserved. So from panic attack to cash flowing asset was 90 days and I used monopoly money to buy it. And I remember sitting back and going, I screwed up. Well, you thought too small. My goals weren't good. Mm. We rewrote them all. We did five deals in our first month. 
Wow. But I didn't know that I could, like how I bought that property, we essentially borrowed from my wife's 401k. Right. When I wrote those goals, I didn't even know I could use creative solutions like that to finance deals. I just thought I have to save up 20% every time I wanna buy a property. So if you set your goals based on what you think you know now, you're probably gonna shoot too small. Right. So you need proof of concept. I would say write goals to start, for sure. Write them based on what you know. After you do your first deal, revisit them. Yeah. Go to Key West, get yourself a pig book. Yeah, okay? <laughs> get yourself a pig goal book. You know, but th th that really goes into people trying to get into real estate is yeah. they go, what do you eat for breakfast? Why Why do you wear that brand of shoes? <laughs> Literally in my DMs, people go, what brand of shoes are Pace wearing? And I'm like, bro, it ain't gonna make you do any more deals any right. faster. But they that's all they know, mm -hmm. right? Is they wanna emulate what is a, a, a success model to them. Yeah. So write your, write your goals. I break my goals into five different goals, okay? So I've got family goals, mm -hmm. personal goals, brand goals, business goals, asset goals, right? Because I have businesses that are not asset right. related, right? Um, I mean, although my businesses are an asset to me, right. my, what I mean is a physical hard asset, right? right? Like real estate, multifamily, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and I update my goals every 60 days. Yep. What I love about what you just said is that every time I go into my goals list, there's like 50 of them. I'm like, okay, did that one, did that one, did that one, did that one. And I'm like, dude, I... I am thinking way too right. small. Yeah. You think that every time, but when you make the goal, you it, think it it's so big. It feels like a stretch goal when you write it down. Right? right. You write them down. I was like five houses over the next five years. Ugh, I, don't, I don't know how I'm going to find the money to do that. Crazy. And then I was like, oh. But you have to start somewhere. Oh. I, so don't yeah. write down, I'm going to do 5,000 deals this year. It's right. like, okay, it's okay for you to make the smaller goals. Just make sure you go back and you revisit, revisit those. Goals. Yes. Okay, so with your wife, uh, obviously, you know, borrowing against your 401k, was your wife super supportive in this endeavor? Yeah, man. So he took a deep breath, guys, yeah. just so you know. Well, it, well, you know, if this is the origin <laughs> story, I'll tell the whole story. If not, I'll be, I'll be brief. Be but, brief on it. We'll go yeah. into the origin story next. Yeah, yeah, man. She was super supportive the whole way, I think, for a couple of reasons. One was um, she saw how I handled money and where we were financially before I said we were gonna do real estate stuff. And so then when I came to her and said, hey, let's do something responsible, like invest in real estate. She was like, yeah, yeah, we should do that. Cause what you're doing now, ain't gonna cut it, right? So like she was on board from that perspective. And then we took the journey together. Like we read Richard Report Ad together. We read Richest Man in Babylon together, right? So we were learning some of the same financial lessons at the same time and we could talk about them, see how we feel about them, implement some of those strategies into our life together. It wasn't like I was reading and learning all this amazing stuff and then had to go be like, hey, guess what? Right, so I didn't have to go teach her. She was learning. There's was there's together. so much value in what you just said. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get it, married guy. You and yeah. I attract a very yeah. similar demographic. Right. Married kids, right. want to have a family life, right? And people commonly ask, men commonly ask, what question? How do I get my, wife, get involved? my wife involved? How do I get my wife to support me? Yep. And what you just said is two main things. You said, one, my, my wife watched how I was responsible with money. So you essentially earned that ability to go to her and say, I'm going to do this. Right. Right. And she said, I'm there. Right. That's number one. So if you guys are out there, like, I don't care what your job is. I don't care what your income level is. What Henry's saying is like, you need to be responsible re outside of real estate with your capital and be, you know, shrewd in your decisions mm -hmm. so that your wife goes, I have the confidence in your decision-making abilities, but you see people frivolous, wasting money on stupid things. And then all of a sudden you tell your wife, all right, I'm going to get into real estate. Guys, that's not a great way to get your <laughs> wife on board. The second thing is he said he brought his wife involved in the business. Yep. Yep. Amazing. So he, the, you read the books together. Richest Man in Babylon was one. Yeah, Rich Dad Poor Dad, Richest Man in Babylon were the two first books we, we went through. And a lot of those just taught us financial lessons that we weren't implementing in our life. And so we were able to then start implementing those as we were learning and seeing some of the results and fruits of that labor. And that also helped her to be like, okay, there's something to changing. How Building we're confidence. Things, right? Yep. Exactly. Building confidence. All right. So guys, um, we're gonna jump into Henry Washington's origin story, like where he came up, where he, wh what was the thing that triggered him to jump into real estate? What was his first deal, right? And where he's ultimately heading, but you heard it here today, right? I think so many people have a misbelief that they go, I'm gonna hit five grand a month and I'm retiring. <laughs> I'm gonna hit 10 grand a month and I'm retiring. I'm gonna hit 20 grand a month and I'm retiring. I know everybody that hits these goals, they just go, I was thinking way too small, it's time to double down and do it again. I love the story of, I want to do five deals in five years, and he does five deals in one month. That's right. 
So guys, we'll, we'll see you guys in another video. Go and follow him on on the market with bigger pockets. That's a secondary YouTube channel with Jamil Damji, Kathy Fetke. That's right. Who else you guys have? James Daynard and Dave Meyer. Dave Meyer. Yeah. Data Deli. He's the, the best. Data Deli. And um, follow him on Instagram. His links will be down below. Do you have do you have like a mentorship program or anything? I do. I do have a mentorship program. You can check out when you hit that link in my bio, you'll be able to apply. Come come hang out with me. We'll take the link and we'll put it in our bio on Instagram yeah. or on YouTube as well, guys. Yeah. So you guys can get right over to him and see if he you do you have to be in Arkansas? Or you can be anywhere. You can be anywhere. 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 All right. Guys, we'll see you in the next video.